One of these swords is my absolute favourite sword in any museum anywhere in the world. I'm Sue Brunning, I'm curator of the European Early Medieval Collections, and this is my corner. So today I'm going to talk to you about my favourite artefacts in the museum, which are early Anglo-Saxon swords. So I've got three swords here to talk to you about. They all come from the 6th to early 7th century, so this is the Anglo-Saxon period in Britain. In the early Anglo-Saxon period, swords were really the only weapon that was made and used exclusively for warfare. So spears could be used for hunting, for instance, um, same with arrows, and axes were kind of related conceptually also to tools, whereas swords were the only weapon that were basically made for killing other human beings. Swords were also the most prestigious weapon, most prestigious um, type of fighting implement for the early Anglo-Saxons. And we see this in the art and literature from the time, but we also see it in particular from the archaeology, which is what I'm particularly interested in. So for example, during this period when these swords were made in the 6th and 7th centuries, the Anglo-Saxons were burying their dead with grave goods. And that meant that um, the dead person was placed inside the ground, surrounded by an array of artifacts, we find with swords that they're often buried very close to the body. Sometimes they're overlaying part of the body, like the arm and the shoulder, and sometimes they're actually cradled into the arm as if they're sort of being, being hugged like a really beloved possession. So we have this, this closeness between the dead person and the sword. And I think that's because swords were particularly important to that dead person's identity. They said something about the person that was in the grave. One of the things that I was really struck by when I first started studying Anglo-Saxon swords was actually how shabby the condition of many of them are. Now, I'm not talking about the blades of the swords um, when I say that. Uh, these are made from iron, so after about 1500 years or so in the grave, they do tend to come out looking like this, which is kind of um, very highly corroded. What I'm talking about is actually the hilts of these swords, so the handles, the parts of the sword that are held in the hands. These fittings often show quite a lot of wear and tear where the decoration has been worn down or some of the surface ornaments such as gilding, those sorts of things has been worn away. I have one example here. This is probably dating to the um, uh, sixth century and it was found at a cemetery in Faversham in Kent. So not too very far away from where we are in London now. And the part that I want to talk to you about is the pommel, which is the piece at the very end of the handle or the hilt of the sword here. Now, if we take a very close look at the pommel here, we can see that this decoration that runs along the front, there's a line here, starts to disappear towards this end. And also on the top of the pommel here as well, we have quite deep, sort of almond-shaped slashes that have been gilded, so uh, covered with a layer of gold. And we can also see where the depth of those starts to become shallower, where it's worn away and become kind of um, just less distinct and, and, and less, um, less deep. In order to demonstrate how the pommel got into that condition, I have a handy prop, which is my trusty foam sword. Here's one I made earlier. So just stand up. Now, in this period, in the early Anglo-Saxon period, uh, swords are normally being worn on the left-hand side, like this. And uh, so that means we have it kind of here, and that means also that um, it forms kind of a handy hand rest for the sword. So you can see, you know, how this would be quite an attractive place to sort of rest your hand and, and strike a quite an authoritative pose. But what that also means is that this part of the sword here, which is the top part of the pommel, which is the same one that I pointed to on the sword on the table there, is becoming worn. And that's what I've used these pins to demonstrate, because the sword's always being worn like this and the hand is resting on it like this. And so over a period of time, that's where we see the wear start to um, materialise on those parts of the sword there. And that's exactly what we find on our sword from Faversham. One of the other signs of age that we find um, on swords during this period is that they actually start to um, take on lots of different styles. And swords might pass between several different owners over the course of their lives, and then they might acquire this kind of sort of Frankenstein look, as I, I tend to refer to it. It's a little bit like maybe wearing a Roman helmet with like a Victorian tailcoat and a pair of 1980 shell suit bottom trousers, something like that. So you get this mixture of styles. And we've got one sword in the collection which is a bit like this. And that's this one right here, which is rather nice because it's decorated with gold. These gold fittings that are attached to the sword here, um, this one here that's also inlaid with red stones, which are garnets, um, these probably date 
according to their style, to the early 7th century, so around the time when the Sutton Hoo ship burial took place, for example. But the form of the hilt, or the handle itself, is actually thought to be quite earlier. It represents an earlier style of handle. So actually, this sword could have been around for quite a long period of time. But the most common type of addition to swords that's made during this early Anglo-Saxon period are these sets of ring fittings which resemble two interlocking rings that kind of do this and they're attached again to the pommel part of the swords. And I have another example again from Kingsfield in Faversham on the table here and we can see those interlocking rings attached to the pommel just here. Now the most influential theory about what these ring fittings mean is that they're connected with the swearing of oaths in the Anglo-Saxon period. So, for example, if you're a warrior and you're entering the service of a lord, you might swear an oath of service to that person, and then that might be kind of commemorated with the um, addition of a ring to your sword. So if it didn't have one, once you swore that oath, then the ring would be added. There's all sorts of reasons why these rings may have been um, added and removed, but that's quite a convincing theory, I think. So by looking at these, these rings and the mobility of these rings, the addition and removal of fittings, which we've talked about with these two different swords here, we can start to see actually how swords can build up their own biography. They can start to create a life history of events and people that they're related to. The Anglo-Saxons didn't really seem to be too bothered about hiding those blemishes or making those differences blend in. Um, they were quite happy for these sort of mismatched things and these, these scars of life you know, for want of a better description, are quite front and centre and, and are there for everybody to be able to see. And that starts to suggest that there's this idea that actually age and experience are um, something to be, to be kind of boasted about, or something to be shown for, for everybody to, to see. So an old sword is a dependable sword. It's proven, you know that it's faced a lot of fights, it's come through those fights and it's, it's been dependable. A new sword might look very shiny and very nice, but actually it's, it's got no credentials, it's got no track record, it's, it's got no kind of wins underneath its belt. Whereas an old sword is something that, that, that feels familiar in your hand, it's not alien in your hand. And so it becomes almost like a comrade rather than a tool. Then we start to arrive at the reason why this sword, the plainest one on the table, is my favourite sword in any museum anywhere in the world. So if we come and take a look again at the pommel, which we looked at earlier, we've already seen that this is an old sword that's seen a lot of wear during its life. But its owner, one of its owners, has left us the tiniest little message, just the ghost of a message, which is really packing an emotional punch. So very close up onto this, you might just be able to see the faintest trace of a rune. Now, runes are Anglo-Saxon letters, which look a little bit like twigs, lots of straight lines, and uh, they're being used in this period um, to make inscriptions, including the one on this sword. Now, um, this is an ash rune, which looks a bit like a modern day F, so it's kind of like an F, but the cross pieces at the top are angling downwards like that, so it's, it's very much like an F. Now, a poem survives in an Anglo-Saxon manuscript, uh, we call it the Old English Rune Poem, and that tells us all of the meanings of the various runes. Now, the poem was actually written down sometime after the rune on this sword was carved, but if it preserves anything of the meanings of the runes in this earlier period when this sword was made, then it's meaning is actually quite instructive. The ash is extremely tall, precious to mankind, strong on its base. It holds its ground as it should, although many men attack it. Now I think that the relevance of a verse like that is quite clear to a warrior in the early Anglo-Saxon period. So we can start to build a picture of the warrior who owned this sword, carving this inspirational rune upon his sword, something that would give him a kind of um, strength and uh, inspiration to face what was probably still a terrifying prospect, even though warfare in, in those days was, was much more commonplace than it is for the rest of us today. But these swords are also great, I think, as a life lesson to all of us, because they show us that actually age is nothing to be embarrassed about. We shouldn't be worried about our grey hairs and our wrinkles and those sorts of things. They're, they're not a sign of weakness. In actual fact, we should embrace the strength, the authority that they give to us. So that has been my corner. Thank you very much for joining me today. If you like this corner, there are plenty more available on our YouTube channel, which hopefully you will subscribe to and get lots of brilliant content from all of my amazing colleagues.